Prayer is not magic. It's not telling God how to run the universe. It is turning our hearts to the things and people that we're praying for, expressing our love and concern for them, for ourselves and for others. It is inviting God's help, guidance, and direction for us and others. It is trusting that God is walking with us and that God will not abandon us. It is asking God to use us to be the answer to someone else's prayer. Well, if you haven't noticed over the past few weeks, we indeed are in a sermon series on wrestling. And so I thought about borrowing a singlet from the Spuds this week, um, but I was told that's not safe for church, so don't wear that. Wrestling's really never been my thing. I was a basketball player who got beat up by the kids that were much smaller and stronger than me. That's just how it goes. See, I attended a high school that just so happened to be a wrestling powerhouse. Well, we were often accused of recruiting student athletes. The truth was this. Recruitment, it wasn't needed. You see, long before open enrollment at the high school level or the transfer portal in the college level, families would literally uproot themselves from their communities, their jobs, their friend groups, their normalcy to find new homes, new jobs, and new friends and routines in my hometown of Apple Valley. Why, you may ask? Well, it was answered prayers. You see, parents thought that moving to my hometown was the best chance for their kid to win a state championship, to get recruited with a college scholarship, to find a better way of life moving forward. And for some, this was certainly the case. They hit gold. But for others, well, it was fool's gold. Rather than letting the chips fall as they may, some of my best friends took a gamble at controlling their narrative. But how much control did these kids actually have? Now, my assumption would be, uh, depending on how their outcome played out, they might have a strong answer one way or the other. But is it truly the case? Blood, sweat, and tears were shed. But did the outcome reflect what transpired? Were their prayers actually answered? Now, today in our sermon series, as we ponder a different kind of wrestling, we actually turn to Jesus to see how he wrestled with things playing out in his life. As we heard in our preaching text, Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives, and we're told that his disciples followed after him. And once they reached their destination, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. A very direct command to his friends, but you see, Jesus knew what was coming. We're told that he withdrew from his friends, a stone's throw beyond them, he knelt down, and prayed. And yes, church, I want you to hear these words today. Even Jesus prayed to God. Now, he could still see his friends. They could no doubt see him. You see, in many ways, Jesus was modeling to them the way forward. And while he was down on his knees, Jesus boldly prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will be done, but yours. And I wonder today, church, when we are lifting up our prayers to God, how often do we say, not my will, but yours? We're then told that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him in that moment. But being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat was falling like blood onto the ground. And I know that this can be fairly graphic for us to hear this morning, but I think it's important for us to know, again, what it's foreshadowing, that Jesus actually had blood fall on the ground around him. And for me, it's this beautiful snapshot of how Jesus approached wrestling with God. He told his disciples to pray earnestly, this time telling them not to fall into temptation. And I think it's important for us to note today that throughout that Holy Week time especially, Jesus knew that his friends were going to do just that thing. And so he's entering into prayer for himself. He laid all of his cards out to God and to his friends. He said he'd much rather keep things as is, but he's going to put his trust in God. Now, the message puts it this way. Father, remove this cup from me, but please, not what I want. What do you want? Think about that. What if that was our prayer today, God? I have this going on in my life. I'm going to lift it up to you. I would love for you to fix it, but you know what, God? I'm okay if it doesn't play out that way. Good Shepherd, I don't know how you pray. I don't even know if you pray. But I know that we are called to pray, and so I'm going to encourage you to do that. Because I know that as God's followers, 
We're supposed to be one with God. This is what Jesus is doing right here. He's modeling what this looks like for us. He set aside time to give thanks to God, and he set aside time to lift up his grief to God. If you look at these prayers, Jesus is in anguish. He's sweating. He's hurting. He's scared. But he's being real with God. Jesus wasn't a sinner like us, but he was human while on earth. And so he felt all of the emotions that you and I experience. If you picture the things that we go through on a day-to-day basis, maybe we're finding ourselves in a very difficult season of life right now. Maybe we are now separated from a loved one. Maybe a loved one's no longer here. Maybe we've lost our job. Whatever it might be, we're invited to lift those things authentically up to God. Please, God, take things away from me, I beg you, but I'm okay if it doesn't play out the way I want it to. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what we get to do as well. I think this is where our stories begin to interact with Jesus. But if we're honest today, church, I think we often turn to God when we're desiring things to play out the way that we want. And when they do turn out the way that we want, we might give thanks to God. But I think all too often, we pat ourselves on the back because we put in the hard work, right? Like my wrestling buddies from high school, is the glory God's or, or theirs? Jesus gives us a healthy reframe that while we might turn to God with our personal requests, we know that things might not always turn out the way that we desire. God might not answer our prayers or quite simply, God doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we are expecting him to. And it's moments like these when our own personal wrestling with doubt, prayer, and faith begins to play out in our daily lives. Now, as Adam Hamilton shares in his book, Wrestling with Doubt, Finding Faith, unanswered prayer, well, it can easily lead to doubt. For some, it can lead to complete abandonment of faith. And church, I think part of our problem here is our assumption is that God is some sort of genie. Deacon Julie mentioned it to the kids. This isn't magic. It doesn't mean that we ask for something and it happens. Don't get me wrong. God hears and answers prayers. But when we view our relationship as a transaction, where we ask for something and we're given it immediately, I think that we're a bit misguided. Still, there are real prayers prayed by real people to a real God. One example in this book shares about a pastor who struggled with infertility. Now, they finally got pregnant, but they were blindsided with the news midway through that the mother could die if she carried the child to birth. She shared her story in this book. I had always thought that God could and would do anything if enough people prayed. But people had, and God didn't. And so disappointment with God that arises from unanswered prayer, it can penetrate the defenses of even the most committed and faithful people. And maybe you feel that way today as you look back at the last days, weeks, and months, the last few years even, experiencing loss, praying, not receiving what you asked for. As Hamilton continues to point out, many people experience doubt because of unanswered prayers. When it seems that God is silent or even impotent as they cry out to him in their greatest time of need, I'm going to be real with you today, church. I know that we've experienced that within my family from time to time as we've prayed for healing for loved ones that didn't play out the way that we had hoped or expected. And it's in those moments, even more recently than I'd like to admit publicly, where the floodgates of tears have opened because things didn't play out the way that I needed or wanted them to, the way that I had prayed. And yet, church, it's in those moments that I've become someone that others can turn to who are facing the same thing. Because I try not to keep it all inside, I try to be real. And maybe you do the same as well. And then I have an opportunity not just to hold in the anger or the shame or the pain, but instead to create a space for me to sit next to others who are going through the same exact thing. It begins this flip side of the coin approach that can be very much present in a difficult chapter of life. And I think it's important for you to note today, whatever chapter of life you find yourself in, know that it doesn't define your story. This is but a part of it. The best things in life, the greatest joys, well, they're often found in the aftermath of unanswered 
prayers. Think about that. Life's defined by our struggles and our hearts are often refined by adversity. The best thing in life, the greatest joys are often only found in the aftermath of unanswered prayers. And I would, I would even add to that this morning, church, that sometimes our unanswered prayers were answered. We can't see it because it doesn't look the way that we thought it would, even though it's right before our eyes. I don't say that to imply that there aren't things that are of great need, that we should continue to live up. In. And I also don't want to make it seem as though your unanswered prayers weren't important to lift up. But here's the reality for us. God's not a genie. God loves you deeply. And God wants to abide and be present with you in these moments. And we're not alone in this. Because I know I've lifted up those prayers that weren't quite answered the way that I wanted them to. But as Deacon Julie mentioned, we might be missing out on the blessings and the answers to prayer that are scattered around us in different ways than we'd have expected. Over the past number of years here as a pastor at Good Shepherd, I've been able to walk alongside members that have experienced those mountaintop highs and deep valley lows that our opening song today talked about. And in the midst of having faith that could understandably unravel, these people have continued to keep the faith, and it's encouraged me in my walk. Now, recently, a member shared with our pastoral staff their update on life, which includes infertility struggles, adoption roadblocks, and how they've continued to meet with God in the midst of two steps forward and three steps back. Longtime members Christy and Chris Lean gave me permission to share this snapshot of their story because they view it as a part of their testimony with this God who continues to meet with them, this God who's continuing to do work in their life, and this God that continues to promise to journey with them through these chapters of life. Christy shared this with me. Even when we're wrestling with doubt, our faith or our future, she wonders, do we have to wrestle? Or does God really want us to rest in the fact that we can trust what God is doing even though we can't see it right now. now? These words are profound for me, and I pray they're profound for you. Whatever chapter of life story you find yourself in, rather than wrestle with the things that we can't control, what if we were to rest in the presence of the one that goes with you up and down that mountain, the one that loves you deeply just as you are, in the midst of this season where you might be wrestling with faith or infertility or loss of a loved one or your job or closed doors or church, whatever it might be, I hope that these words can encourage you because Christy has taught me to do something that my wrestling classmates could never do, rest. Simply rest. Now, this doesn't mean give up. It doesn't mean discard our faith or our prayers or expectations. It doesn't mean to fall asleep like the disciples in our preaching text. Instead, it says that rest gives us permission to take a deep breath, to spend time with God, taking time to simply be. And while we wait for these prayers to be answered in whatever way they are answered, I invite you to live into Hamilton's example of what prayer is and what prayer isn't. He says this prayer is not magic, it's not telling God how to run the universe. It is turning our hearts to the things and people that we're praying for, expressing our love and concern for them, for ourselves and for others. It is inviting God's help, guidance, and direction for us and others. It is trusting that God is walking with us and that God will not abandon us. It is asking God to use us to be the answer to someone else's prayer. Today, Good Shepherd, I pray that we can turn our hearts to the things that are in our community, in our church, in our world, the things that we interact with daily. I know that we have our own stuff, but if we can take our blinders off for a moment and see the work of God that's happening in this place, in you and through you and outside these walls, it's amazing. Knowing that with God's help, guidance, and direction, we actually get to live out our mission as the church to be an answer to someone else's prayer. When I encourage you to be an answer to someone else's prayer, that doesn't mean that our prayers don't matter as much as theirs, but it does mean that we can be who we were created to be in the waiting. I look out at a world that's troubled. You can turn on your news or go through social media. You find it immediately. 
And I don't believe that God has caused all these problems that are present in our lives or the world, nor do I believe that God can't solve all of them either. But like Jesus lifting his eyes up to God in prayer, saying the words, thy will be done, I pray that all of us here today can find peace in whatever our circumstances are, that our doubt can dissipate and our faith can be made whole. And in this season of waiting, we can truly be followers of Jesus, equipped and called to be who we were created to be for others. When it seems that our prayers go unanswered, may we find ways to be an answer to prayer for each other. As Hamilton reminded me out of my own pain, as we continue to trust and pray, we see some of God's most amazing work when God uses us to be the miracle someone else is praying for and uses others to be the miracle that we have prayed for. Church, I pray in turn that our prayers will be answered to through the work of Jesus and his people. May it be so for you. May it be so for all. Amen.